Welcome to worship. We, the bishops of Region 2, have designed this service to allow your pastors and deacons to take a break the weekend after Easter. They have worked hard during the pandemic, and we are glad to assist them by providing this worship service. As we worship, we join with people from ELCA congregations throughout Region 2. Today, you will worship with people from Wyoming, Hawaii, and El Paso, Texas. Worshippers from beaches of California to the deserts of Arizona, from the salt flats of Utah to the enchantment of New Mexico, from the Sierra Nevadas to the Rocky Mountains, which frame Nevada and give Colorado its contours, we all join together to praise our God. Our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, points out that we ELC Lutherans are church together. Well, today, this worship service allows us to be church together. And being church together means ministry is a team sport. We would like to thank this team for their participation. We thank the musicians from throughout Region 2 who are providing the music, the pastors, the deacons, and lay leaders who are leading the liturgy, we thank the Reverend Dr. Shauna Hannon from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, who is preaching God's word. Thank you, Mr. Bost, for weaving the worship pieces together from across the region so that we may worship together today. We are grateful for this team of leaders. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to thank you, the people of Region 2, pastors, deacons, and lay people. We thank you for your faithfulness. This has been a difficult year for many of us. The words of hope and the help you share with one another, with your communities, and with the world is wonderfully important as you offer your love of Christ Jesus with people near and far, making a much needed difference during these challenging days. God bless you as you worship today. Our prayer is that as you worship, you will receive God's hope, faith, strength, all you need to follow our Lord in the week to come. And let us rejoice in the good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the reconciling love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. 
Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts, the fourth chapter. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Word of God, word of life. See how good and how pleasant it is for God's people to live together as one. It is like precious oil on Aaron's head, running down on his beard, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, falling on the hills of Zion, for that is where God bestows the blessing, life that has no end. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked in the room where the disciples were for fear of the temple authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, the Savior showed them the marks of crucifixion. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw Jesus, who said to them again, Peace be with you. As Abba God sent me, so I'm sending you. After saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. It happened that one of the 12, Thomas, nicknamed Didymus, or twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, we've seen Jesus. Thomas's answer was, I'll never believe it, without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand into the spear wound. On the eighth day, That is, a week later, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time, Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them, saying, Peace be with you. Then to Thomas, Jesus said, Take your finger and examine my hands. Put your hand into my side. Don't persist in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas said in response, my Savior and my God. Jesus then said, you've become a believer because you saw me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs as well, signs not recorded here in the presence of the disciples. But these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten, so that by believing, you may have life in Jesus' name. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. 
In the evening on that same day, that is, the same day that Mary Magdalene made her way to the, to, to the tomb, saw the stone had been rolled away and ran to tell two of the disciples about it. That is, the same day that the two disciples then ran to the tomb, the tomb themselves and saw that it was empty, at which point the beloved disciple saw and believed. It was still on that day, the same day that those men ran back to their homes and Mary Magdalene stayed by the tomb, weeping. There she encountered two angels and then Jesus, whom she mistook as the gardener. And then she ran again to tell others, I have seen the Lord Jesus. He is alive. <sighs> Already that's quite a day, huh? Too much, really. So much surprise, so much running around, so much announcing, trying to get everybody on the same page. So many emotions. It looks a lot like a day in the life of grief. Even with some good news, you can't always just turn off deep grief. What is going on here? I can't believe it. What is real here? Have you ever wondered that? What is real here? One day we've got, I can't believe he's dead. Friday. Two, day, two days later we've got, I can't believe he's alive. Easter Sunday. Most days, though, might be more like Saturday. Teetering between death and life, it could go either way, really. What do we do in the midst of such chaos and confusion and emotional flooding when so much has already happened in a day and it's only noon? Some of us self-protect, hide behind closed doors, isolate out of fear. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's one of the messages I heard from some of you who joined me in a Bible study over Zoom focused on this story. I heard from some of you that it makes sense that there are those who isolate in these situations. Thank you, by the way, for those of you who joined me in reflecting on this story. I learned, I learned so much from you, and you might even hear some of your perspectives in this sermon. So. Thank you. I noticed something was different this time when we looked at this story, something new about how we reacted to it. And I'm not just talking about the shock of hearing about people gathering behind closed doors with people not in one another's pods or all of that touching going on. That seems riskier after the kind of year that we've had or someone breathing on others indoors. We've actually had to grapple with how much power we have to affect one another. I heard a podcast, you've maybe heard of it, On Being with Krista Tippett. And she was reflecting on this past year and she said, we've become a danger to each other by virtue of our breath. That's heavy. So yes, all of those details in the story rise to the surface this year in particular, but even more, I sensed from you deep compassion for each of these characters and the way they reacted given what they had encountered. I noticed your gracious curiosity about the characters' reactions as opposed to making quick judgments. And I noticed your recognition of the complexity of these characters and the mix of emo emotions that each one might have, even in the course of just one day. And so I'd like to invite all of us to adopt such a stance that is one of compassion, curiosity, recognition of another's complexity, what is unspoken? What is the story behind the story for them? And to me, 
those things feel like a breath of fresh, safe air, like the Holy Spirit moving within us and among us. To me, that seems to be more than words of peace, but a, but a chance to inhale peace. So with that safe breath of peace in our being, let's get curious. Let's be compassionate. Let's acknowledge the complexity of the characters in this story. We've already acknowledged that it makes sense for the other disciples to lock themselves up out of fear, but what about the temple authorities? Now, this kind of curiosity or compassion doesn't excuse their behavior, but, but yeah, when you're in authority, you've got some power, you have a lot to lose, especially if you've staked your whole life on that authority. That is, if your identity and your ego is tied to maintaining that authority, you have a lot to lose, right? Thomas, too, demands to have it his way. Unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. I'm reminded here of writer Richard Rohr's proposal about faith, the opposite of faith, actually. Well, what do you think? What would you say is the opposite of faith? Rohr suggests the opposite of faith isn't doubt, because really, as the story shows, and as, as many of you pointed out, even the believing, there could still be some lingering uncertainty. That's real. So no, Rohr says, not doubt. The opposite of faith is control. The temple authorities protect what they don't want to lose by controlling the threat. The disciples locked themselves up by controlling their surroundings. Thomas wants it his way. I will not believe unless A, B, C. Controlling Thomas. Ah, let's, let's call this story that. <laughs> Jesus disrupts the temple authorities. Not even the cross could keep him dead. He breathes again. Jesus disrupts the disciples' isolation. Not even locked doors could keep him out. Well, that's where that very long day ends. <laughs> Too much for one day, isn't it? The next words we get in the story, remember what they were? On the eighth day, that is a week later. What? <laughs> where in the world did that week go? How many times this past year have we asked that? What happened? <laughs> I just wonder if Jesus needed time to think about what he would do with controlling Thomas's demands. If I give him A, B, and C, will others demand the same? And what will that mean once I ascend to my father? But Jesus does it. He gives Thomas a chance to touch his wounds, perhaps scars by now a week later, and for others to see them as well. But he adds, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Thank you, Jesus, for recognizing that people come to believe in different ways. Some by seeing some by touching, some by hearing the confession or the witness of others. Another way to say this is, thank you, Jesus, for recognizing that people need different things to help them drop their need to control. For that, what did Jesus provide? Being present. Words of assurance. Peace be with you. His own breath, his own body. We might call that 
intimacy. Into me see. While that is not a reframing that reflects the words etymology, it can be a helpful reframing in times of chaos and confusion and a mix of, of emotions that lead to a need to control. Intimacy as into me see. Here I am. I see you. You are safe with me. I want to know you, and I am willing to be known by you. Upon hearing such things, some of us may even begin to drop the need to control and begin to have faith in the one who is offering these things, Jesus. Before asking us to bear witness to this one, God says first, I am willing to be known by you up close and personal. Here is who I am. To know God, we must know Jesus, the incarnate one, the word made flesh. Let's be compassionate for this character in the story too. Let's get curious about Jesus. Let's recognize the complexity of our God who is known in Jesus. When we do that, we find maybe that it, it might be just as confusing for us as it was maybe for those first disciples. First, he's not supposed to die. That's not possible if he's the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for. But he dies. And then, wait, he's supposed to be dead. But he's not in the tomb. And now he's in the garden. And, and now we got through these locked doors. He's alive. But wait, he still has his wounds. So, like, this really happened, right? How can you be the divine one who heals if you've got these wounds, these scars from that traumatic event? In that question, I hear echoes of, he saved others. Let him save himself. Indeed, our God as wounded healer offers the green light for us to recognize our woundedness, to talk about our own scars of trauma. So many, this year alone. Those of you who lead faith communities, I can't even imagine how tired you must be after this year. Thank you for all that you do, for who you are. Those of you who grieve the death of loved ones who died from COVID, but hear people say it's not real and carelessly go about their days. Ugh. Ugh. Peace be with you. Those whose bodies we remember, those who have been killed by guns, by other bodies, by one's own body, we miss you. Sadly, we won't be the last to experience these things. But perhaps in some way it's comforting to know we're not the first. It's comforting to know God has experienced it. Not because it's okay or it was the way it had to be, but it happened. We were told the word would become flesh and dwell among us. And that word is Jesus, God in the flesh, wounds and all. Jesus' wounds are the watermark of his resurrected body, always there, sometimes faint. A watermark on paper is used to discourage counterfeiting. And when it is held up to the light, its maker 
is identified. Someone who claims to be the Messiah, but has not been willing to walk alongside you in your suffering, who has not experienced suffering of one's one's own and has no wounds to show it, that's a counterfeit God. That is not the Messiah. Jesus' wounds are the watermark of his resurrected body that as the light of the world himself reveals his maker. God bears the scars of those wounds, and there is strength in that vulnerability. So too with us, the body of Christ. We won't get through life without a scar or two or many as individuals, as communities, as the church, not because it's okay or the way it has to be, but it happens for some more than others, to be sure. I invite us to be compassionate, to have compassionate for one another, curiosity about the stories behind one another's stories. Let's recognize the complexity of others, which reminds me. You know what else was different about the Bible study and this story this year? More than ever, many of you helped us see those who are not seen. For example, some didn't have the privilege of protecting themselves behind locked doors, but they were there. (laughs) Who were the essential workers on that day? You drew our attention to those who are unnamed, not seen. For example, the women greeting and serving water and cleaning. Surely they are there. Let's recognize them. Let's see them. The whole point of the story seems to be Jesus sees people for who they are. For some, that's enough to believe and to run and tell others. Seeing in John's gospel is analogous to knowing, seeing, really seeing, as a kind of knowing prompts Jesus to act. Jesus sees their fear. Jesus appears to them in the midst of their fear. Jesus speaks to them, peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus isn't afraid of being up close and personal. He breathes on his disciples, invites them to see his wounds, invites them to touch him, our tangible God, our intimate God. Let's call the story that. Maybe that's the whole point of Easter, this whole season that is before us. God shows God's willingness to be known. And God wants to know you. God sees us. God really sees you. God speaks to us. You belong to me. It's so powerful, isn't it? Being seen, really being known for who we are, and belonging. The whole point of Easter is that God backs up God's words with actions. I'll do anything for you, my beloved. I'll die for you. Even more, I will live for you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.
gathered together in the love of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Strengthen your church, O oh God, that we may unite in prayer as well as practical help for those who are suffering for all reasons and seeking you. We pray for strength, wisdom, and guidance that we might not grow weary in proclaiming the gospel and in being bearers of hope during these uncertain and challenging times. Grant to our churches and communities strength and resilience as they minister among those who are most vulnerable among us and in everything they do as reflections of your love. God, have mercy. E kai kai a mako i ka mana o Kristo. Nā nā e lawe mai ke kaulike mako honua nei. Ke pule nei mako no nā ala kai o ko mako lāhui. I mea e hiki ai lāko ke hanapū no kapono o ka lehu lehu i ke ia wā o ka mea ho o mai honua. A hiki a lāko ke kāpai aku i nā mea āke ake a e ho o ka awale ana i a mako. E kōkua mai i a lāko e hana me ka āvivi no ka ho o la ana, ka ho i ho i ana i ke o la, a me ka mana o la na, e ke a kua aloha, e ho o lohe mai i ko mako upule. Grant peace and justice to nations and cities where there are conflicts, war, or violence. Give us courage to hold the leaders of nations accountable as they listen to the cries of the voices and protect the dignity of all people. We continue to pray for the Oromo people in Ethiopia and around the world. And others we name now. God of mercy. Receive our prayer. Trae sanidad y restauración para aquellos que están ansiosos y preocupados por los enfermos y afligidos, por las personas sin hogar y encarcelados, para aquellos que viajan y para aquellos con cualquier necesidad. Muévenos, oh Dios, a trabajar de la caridad a la justicia mientras servimos y abogamos por aquellos que están oprimidos, hambrientos y víctimas de la violencia. Enséñanos a mostrar una hospitalidad radical y compasión hacia todos, sin importar quiénes son. Dios de misericordia, recibe nuestra oración. I will say the prayer in Bahasa, Indonesia. Tetaplah ilhami kami untuk bekerja demi keadilan rasial, ya Tuhan. Kobarkanlah hati kami untuk senantiasa melakukan kehendakMu, hingga kasih dan kemurahan hati menaklukkan dan menghilangkan segala jenis kesenjangan dan ketidakadilan. Jadikanlah sinode ini sebuah komunitas yang mengasihi yang satu dengan yang lain. dan dengan sesama kami. Ya Allah yang penuh belas kasih, terimalah doa kami. In life and in death we are yours. We thank you for our ancestors in faith who've taught us to lament and to praise. We are especially mindful of the more than 500,000 people who have died in this country and the two and a half million people who have died around the world from COVID-19. Bless the loved ones of those who have died with our presence and support. We remember those most dear to us whom you have entrusted to the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And we name them now. God of mercy, we commend these prayers to you, O God. We entrust to the Spirit those prayers that we cannot yet pray, trusting what the Spirit does for us with sighs too deep for words. 
for all that you know that we hold. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. In the language of your own choice, I will be praying it in Finnish. Isä meidän, joka olet taivaissa, pyhitetty olkoon sinun nimesi. Tulkoon sinun valtakuntasi, tapahtukoon sinun tahtosi myös maan päällä niin kuin taivaassa. Anna meille tänä päivänä meidän jokapäiväinen leipämme ja anna meille meidän syntimme anteeksi. Niin kuin mekin anteeksi annamme niille, jotka ovat meitä vastaan rikkoneet. Äläkä saata meitä kiusaukseen, vaan päästä meidät pahasta. Sillä sinun on valtakunta ja voima ja kunnia iankaikkisesti. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please share a sign of peace with those around you. Sierra Pacific, Southwest, Pacifica, Grand Canyon, and Rocky Mountain Synods are thankful for your faithful stewardship to your congregation. It is through your enduring support of tithe, time, and talent that fulfills the mission of our church. We are church together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Join us as we sing Blessed Be.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you.